All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to... I want to preach a message this morning on four major judgments. Four major judgments in the Bible. Now, there's a lot of judgments in the Bible, but there's four major ones that is associated with us. And to start it out, we'll start in 1 John chapter 16. 1 John chapter 16, and we'll look at verse 8 through 11. We're, we started a study in 1 Corinthians for Sunday school, and in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you have two major passages on the judgment seat of Christ, which is the judgment for Christians. And I want to start the book of James. James is practically heavy for has got a lot of practical stuff that's heavy on the Christian's works. And the judgment seat of Christ is about your works. It's not about your salvation. It's about your works. And uh, so we'll be studying a lot on works associated with the Christian in both Sunday school and the book of James. Okay, so I wanted to preach this message. This is a basic message on some four major judgments, and three of these judgments affect you as a Christian. One of them, I hope, does not affect you, because if it does, that means you're still lost. But if it does affect you, we can get that taken care of. Okay, amen? You, you don't have to leave today being lost. You can be saved, amen? And, and we're more than happy to help you with that. But uh, this is four, ju- four major judgments. Now there's a lot more judgments in the Bible than th- just these four judgments. I'm not saying these four judgments are the only judgments there is. For example, at the end of the millennium, right here, and this, this message is going to be a heavy doctrinal message a, little bit, a lot of teaching in this message. But uh, there's a judgment called the judgment of nations right here. I'm not even covering that judgment. That's a major judgment in the Bible. There's a lot of different judgments in the Bible I'm not covering. I'm not saying that these four judgments are the only four. I'm saying these four judgments are major for us today. Major for us to understand. So number one is the judgment of sin at Calvary. The judgment on sin. In John 16, 8 through 11, it says, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is judged. This is a judgment on sin. And the man of sin, the prince of this world, the God of this world, and all those that are associated with him. So let's look at the judgment of sin first. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started here. Lord, I pray that you'll take in, uh, bless the message. I pray that you'll definitely be with uh, Fred's niece. I pray that you'll take in, uh, help her to heal, but not only to heal in her body, but I pray that you will take in, uh, show her the, uh, that she can be saved and Know for sure she's going to heaven when she dies. I pray that you'll help her to understand that she needs you in every aspect of her life. I pray that you'll bring a good witness by her way so that she can receive you as her Savior in this time of, that she's in need. I pray that also that you'll be with the congregation as they come here, that you'll feed them, that you'll give them something from your word, I pray that you'll use me as a mouthpiece this morning. I pray that you'll bless what I say. 
help this lesson. It could be a little bit complicated if not delivered right. I pray that you'll help me deliver it in such a way that it will be clear, understandable, easy to understand, one that will convict and help us as Christians. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So it says of judgment because the prince of this world is judge. Now who is the prince of this world? Who's the God of this world? Satan. Satan. It's the devil. Satan is the prince of this world. And he's connected with sin. You say he's connected with sin? Yeah. Satan is sin personified. Alright. Jesus Christ is righteousness personified. And Satan is his opposite. He's sin personified. Okay? You say he's sin personified? Sure. That's why when you sin, that first time when you sin, when you enter into sin, without Christ's righteousness, you are a child of the devil. Say, preacher, I'm a child of the devil. I thought we were all the children of God. No, you've been listening to somebody giving you amateur psychiatry. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that man in sin is a child of the devil. In Job, they're called the children of pride. Um, Jesus Christ says to the Pharisees, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. And... Um, the children of Belial, which were children of rebellion, they were considered the children of the devil. Okay? Now take your Bible and turn to... I want to show you how the devil is sin personified. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 4. And pay attention to the wording that is given to Cain when the Lord gives him a warning. Now Cain was supposed to do the right kind of sacrifice that he was commanded, but because he disobeys God and he sacrifices his own type of sacrifice, his vegetables, which was a type of his works, the Lord doesn't recognize it. He says, Cain, you can't go your way. You have to do things my way and be obedient. Now look what he says to him. In uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. He says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be what? His desire. And thou shalt rule over him. Now you see there that sin is personified. It says sin is called his. Sin's personified there. You know in Thessalonians, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Antichrist, which is the devil who becomes, who's a man, he sits down in the tribulation time period. That's on your chart. That's right in the middle here. He sits down in the temple in Jerusalem and he claims to be God and the whole world worships him. You know what he's called in that passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? He's called the son of perdition, the man of sin. The man of sin. Okay? Now, son of perdition means destroyer. Okay? Or destruction. It's the same character of Apollyon in Revelation chapter 9. Alright? Who is given the power of destruction? Who's the destroyer in the Bible? Satan is. The Bible clearly says that Satan is the destroyer. Okay? And it also says that Satan has the power of death. Okay? Why do people die? Say, because we get sick. 
Well, it has more than do than that. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. There's a reason Satan has the power of death because he's sin personified. Okay? He's sin personified. Now, take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. So when a man's lost, sin has power over him. Sin is inside of him. He has the seed of sin inside of him, and the wages of sin is death. That sin inside of him is going to bring death. Okay? Our body will die because it's a body of sin. Unless your soul has been saved, your soul will die a second time. It's called the second death. Why? Because of sin. Sin affects us. It kills us. It brings death. Romans chapter 6 verse 20 says, For when we were the servants of sin, we ye were free from what? Righteousness. So when, when somebody's dead and lost and trespasses a sin, they are free from righteousness. In other words, righteousness is not a part of them. That's why God says to the lost man that all our righteousness are as what? Filthy, Filthy rags. Because in God's eyes, even the plowing of the wicked is sin. Everything, everything that a lost man does that we say is good is still sin in God's eyes. There's no such thing as a righteous man who's in his sin. There's no such thing. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, if Jesus Christ is righteousness and you're without Christ, you're without righteousness. You're free from righteousness. It says, For when we were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from what? Sin. Free from sin. You were free from righteousness, but once you accept Jesus Christ, who is the righteous one, you receive His righteousness, now you're free from sin. You've gone to the opposite side. Okay? <coughs> free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end, amen, everlasting life. There it is. Instead of eternal death, now we have eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through, not our own righteousness, but through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now if you take your Bible and turn to the chapter before, Romans chapter 5. We're going to look at a lot of verses this morning. I want you to turn and read these verses because it's going to show you what this judgment of sin was. For if by Romans chapter 5, look at verse 17 and 18. It says, For if by one man's offense, death reigned. He's the God of this world. He's the King of this world. Death reigned. By one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's the opposite. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment, now there's the judgment, of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Alright, so what you have is that judgment on sin is the judgment on Satan at the cross of Calvary. You know what happened when Jesus Christ came 
and died on the cross of Calvary. The Bible says He was made, He who knew no sin was made sin for us. So we re- He took our sin and we got His righteousness. As the serpent was lifted up on, on the pole in the wilderness, I'm not quoting it right, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In other words, Jesus Christ was made the personification of sin on the cross. You know what He did? He judged sin of this world. He paid for this, all the sins of this world. All of them. Every single one. Past, present, future. All sin was paid for on the cross. You say, why do people still die and go to hell? Because they don't receive the payment. It's not because the payment wasn't made. It was made. There's nobody that has to die and go to hell. Their sins have been forgiven. It's been paid for. All you have to do is receive them. All you have to do is receive His righteousness. (coughs) Righteousness personified is Jesus Christ. And 1 John... 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, he have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now you see that? That's Jesus. Righteousness is Jesus Christ personified. He is the righteous. And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of who? The whole world. Sin was taken care of at the cross. It was done. It was judged. Satan lost at the cross. He lost the battle. He was done. He was judged. He was judged at the cross. When Jesus Christ said, It is finished, buddy, it was finished. It was a done deal. And He was judged at the cross. 2 Corinthians um, Corinthians 5.21 shows when we receive Christ, He takes our sin and He gives us righteousness. It says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in Him. So not only is He righteous, but when we receive Jesus Christ, we get into His body, guess what? We're the righteousness of God in Him, spiritually. Now I know that's your soul. There's a difference between your soul and your body. Your body's still dying because it still has sin on it. Now, Say, preacher, why didn't I quit sinning when I got saved? Because you're still in a body of sin. And you're waiting for the redemption of your body. But that soul was sealed till the day of redemption. And it's in Christ. There's a difference between your soul and your body. The soul never sins anymore. Sin can't touch it. It's... It's righteous in God. There is no sin with the soul. But with the body, we still have sin. The key to salvation is obedience of the faith, obeying the gospel. And the key to rewards is obedience to works. Now that's important. That's important. It shows the difference between why the Christian believes in faith without works and why a Christian serves the Lord with works. Do I believe in works? Absolutely. Do I think you're under works? Absolutely. For your reign with Christ. Your reign with Christ. To please Christ in this flesh, you're under works. You're on the works. That's why James is such a practical book for the Christian. 
Because it teaches about works. Okay? Now that's not salvation of the soul. That is obedience by works in serving Christ. And you got to get the two separate. Your salvation is without works. The Bible says um, in Romans 6, 16-18, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? There's obedience. His servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that we were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being made free from sin, ye are become the servants of righteousness. Well, if you're a servant of righteousness, that means you work for righteousness, right? Yeah. When you got saved, you became a servant of righteousness. A servant of righteousness. What? Know ye not? That ye are bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to Him. You should serve God with your body. That's your service. But then your salvation was a free gift though. There's no works. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is still very true for you. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Say, preacher, you're confusing me. You're telling me that I have to work, but you're telling me I can't work? And <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Now, you can't work for your salvation, but after you're saved, you ought to work. <laughs> Now, now you get you can't work for your salvation. Christ had to do that for you. That's a free gift. But buddy, everything after that is works. I, I mean, they a lot of denominations that think they can lose their salvation. They'll say, "You Baptist, you Baptist, you think you can take and get saved and live any way you like?" Oh no, we do not. No, we do not. Because we understand the judgment seat of Christ. And we understand the judgment of sin. Now this next judgment I want to talk about is the judgment of the sins of the flesh. Now you get saved, your soul is sealed and preserved. But what is not? The flesh is not sealed yet. We're waiting for the redemption of our body. And... Uh, Thessalonians make it clear that we are made in the image of God, meaning we have three parts. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. Okay? Now that body is still connected with sin. We're supposed to crucify the body and consider it to be dead to sin and put it under subjection to serve Christ. Okay? If we do not, as children of God, God will step in and say, discipline is required. Why? Because our God knows how to judge. Our God knows how to judge. And that's the judgment of our flesh after we get saved. But the Lord is compassionate and He allows us to judge our flesh first before He steps in. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and look at verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. I'm going to give you a minute to turn to it. This passage many a times will use to illustrate the Lord's Supper. Okay? And Lord's Supper, I always preach that you need to take care of any controversy with God, which means take care of your sin, deal with your sin, before you partake of it. A lost man, the Lord's Supper does nothing for him because he's not saved. You say, well, he's drinking destruction. To... No, he's destroyed anyways. He's under debt. <coughs> we talked about that with the first judgment. <coughs> Sorry, losing my voice here. He's under debt. He's up here. The lost man's up here. We're talking about the Christian now. We're talking about the Christian with the sins of the flesh. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31 says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay? So then is your flesh being judged. And earlier in the passage, it, it tells you that that's because we don't judge ourselves. That's why many of our, our sleep, which that means die or sick or are weak, because God's judging us. Okay? Does God sometimes judge a Christian with health problems? Sure He does. Sometimes. I to, now the trick is understanding when God's judging you and understanding when you're going through a fiery trial because Satan's upset with you. Sometimes it's hard to tell. I mean, some Christians sit back and well, they're going through that because of their sin. It has nothing to do with their sin. It's actually because of their righteousness. And Satan's upset with them. <coughs> so, when it comes to judging a person... I mean, if the sin's obvious and it's a consequence to sin, okay. I mean, for example, if you're a guy and you're messing around with porn stars and paying them off, and then you get called into a court, I'm sorry, that's because of your sin. Catching up <coughs> with you. And yeah, you're I am sorry. Your your sin caught up with you. Thank you, brother. That that'll help. So uh sometimes your sin catches up. I'm not trying to get too political. I mean, my view of politics right now is I vote against somebody. I don't really vote for somebody. And uh I know who I'll vote for. But hey, I mean, I, I get this uh, email because I'm on the Republican thing. He says, there are truths I have done no wrong. I look at him like, buddy, if you'd listen to Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, you wouldn't be in this mess. <laughs> I mean, don't tell me you haven't done no wrong. You may have not done any legal wrong. They might be framing you there by the laws of the United States, but don't tell me you didn't do no wrong. The wages of sin caught up with you. Consequences. Sin has consequences. I don't care if you're saved. If you sin, you're not going to get away with it. There's consequences to sin. There's consequences. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes those consequences catches up with us before we take care of them. <coughs> now the Bible tells us that we can judge our sin. We can judge it ourselves. And the Lord will allow us to judge it, thank God. Now take your Bible and turn to John chapter 3. Now this is different than the soul. Now here's where it gets a little bit confusing. A lot of people get confused on this passage. The Bible says in 1 John, did I say John or 1 John? 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 6 through 10. Now, like I said, this is heavy teaching. This is a doctrinal message. I'm covering a lot of doctrinal things in this message. Some messages are aimed for the heart, some messages is to establish you in doctrine. I'm trying to establish you in some doctrinal truths, okay? 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in Him, as Jesus Christ the righteous, in Him sinneth not. But preacher, I've sinned. That's because your soul ain't in. Your soul is what's in Him, not your body. You realize your soul has never sinned? Once you got saved, your soul doesn't sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth have not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. 
For this purpose the Son of God was manifest that they might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, when you hit this passage, you better separate your body and your soul. You better separate the two. Because if you don't separate the two, everybody that gets saved, they'll say, well, if I sin, I'll lose my salvation. Because a real Christian would never sin. A real Christian wouldn't do that. How many ever heard of that? A real Christian would not do that. Oh, I, real Christians will do a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, they'll do a lot of things. And uh, the difference you have is that soul is in Jesus Christ righteous and belongs to God. Part of Christ. But that body is still a body of sin. It still belongs to the devil and it's still going to die. We call it the old man and the new man. The old nature and the new nature. The inner man and the outer man. Paul, Paul spends quite a lot of time on it. The old man that you're supposed to crucify. That's why he gets frustrated and says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of sin? I was dealing with some guys that believed that once they got saved, they never sinned again. And uh, they didn't believe in eternal security, but they, 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 they thought they had never sinned after they got saved. I said, man, you're dishonest with yourself. You, you have no reality of what sin is if you think you've never committed a sin since you've gotten saved. I mean, there you are, First John chapter 1. He that saith, he hath no sin is a liar. I mean, uh, that's baloney. I took him to Paul and said, Paul said, oh wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of death? Boy, they just want to accept it. They want to accept it. I never met so many proud religious people in my life. I'll tell you. They want to accept it. But that's the difference between the two. Now we, have, we should judge our sin. Now take your Bible and turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John Chapter 1. I got to move along here. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. Now, here's how you judge our, your sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There you go. Facing the reality of your sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You say that's talking about salvation. No, it's not. You read through that chapter and circle every time it says fellowship. That chapter's talking about fellowship. Your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, how your sin affects your fellowship. So here's what you do you need to judge yourself. You need to judge yourself. And when you see sin in your life, get down and say, Oh Lord, I sinned again and name the sin to the Lord. Don't name it to the preacher. I don't need to know your sin. I, I, I like to live in a bubble and think you're this perfect pew member. Well, let me live in my bubble. I don't want to know your sin. Okay? <laughs> you get down there and confess your sins to the Lord. Say, Lord, take this dirty rotten sin that I did this of. Please wash me in your precious blood. Help me to get victory. Help me to fight this thing. Help me to win over this sin. And then fight that sin until you get victory over it. But don't ignore your sin. Don't ignore it. Deal with it. Deal with it. Judge it. Look at what it is. It's sin. Deal with your sin. The Christian that quits fighting sin loses the battle of life. He loses. Many a Christian has lost because they've given up fighting sin. You're going to fight sin till the day you die. 
until the day you die. But fight a good fight. Finish your course. Fight sin. Judgment number three is the judgment seat of Christ. Now there, when we die, we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10, it says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now that's talking to saved believers. Saved believers there. You will stand before Christ and give an account of your life. Of the good and the bad. You know, even, that, even though I'm saved? Yes. Because you're going to be judged according to your works and how you built on Jesus Christ. How you built on that foundation. And uh, there's two great passages on the judgment seat of Christ. One of them is at 2 Corinthians 5 and the other one's 1 Corinthians 3. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, great passage on the judgment seat of Christ, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done what in his body so you're going to be judged on how well you put your body under subjection and how well you fight sin as a Christian not your salvation but how well you live the Christian life is what's going to be determined at the judgment seat of Christ. Done in the body, according to that He hath done, whether it be good or bad. In other words, that's when your good works outweigh your bad works. And that has nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with your crown and your reign and your rewards as a Christian. I'm going to preach another message on the judgment seat of Christ and the crowns you can wear. What you can win and what you can lose. That's another message for another time. Might do that next Sunday. But, um, but we're going into that. Or I might just cover it with her in Sunday school. But uh, you need to understand you will be judged. You will be judged as a Christian. In 1 Corinthians... Chapter 3, 11 through 15, it says, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid which is Jesus Christ. When you get saved, you have a good foundation. You're on a solid foundation. Jesus Christ is the foundation. For other foundation, uh, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's not salvation, but every man's work. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it. Oh boy. I got one message I preach. What if God told your life as a tale to be told and read it in front of everyone? Ooh. You, you know what I want to do? I want to go to the Lord Jesus Christ, confess my sins, and watch Him pull out the white out on my biography. <laughs> He's going to read at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen? I'd rather deal with it now than there. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. A reward. The Lord says if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Christian, get some rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Do some works. Get busy for the Lord. Work for the Lord. Do something. I, I like the, that one song. Work. For the night is coming when man's work is o'er. How many of you know the hymn I'm talking about? There's a time to work for the Lord. Right now is the time. Right now is the time. Right now is the time to try to do something for God. 
Once you're dead, once you're at the judgment seat of Christ, then it's just a time to enjoy the Lord. Amen? Enjoy the Lord, but you don't have any time to earn rewards. There will be some that receive rewards. There will be some that have received shame at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not going to be a picnic. It's not going to be easy. One should prepare for the judgment seat of Christ. A wise Christian prepares for the judgment seat of Christ. Are you ready for that judgment? Then there's one other judgment. And this judgment, nobody here should be at this judgment. This judgment should be settled. This judgment, the judgment seat of Christ is right here after the rapture. Because you, if you're going to reign with Him, you have to be judged before you reign. And you reign right here. Not right there, I'm sorry, right here. Millennium. You reign a thousand years with Christ. We come back and we reign with Him. You're already judged at the judgment seat of Christ when you come back to reign with Christ. There's another judgment coming after everything's said and done. And it's right here. That judgment's called the Great White Throne Judgment. The Great White Throne Judgment. You say, why does that apply to people today? Well, some people might wind up at the Great White Throne Judgment. Why? Because they didn't receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you look at the Great White Throne Judgment, that's in Revelation chapter 20. And this one right here, some people at this judgment wind up going to the lake of fire. It says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is what? The book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to there it is. Their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast in a lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found, written in the book of life, was cast where? Into the lake of fire. Let me give you a little secret. Every Christian that receives Jesus Christ as in Christ the righteous, guess what? His name's written in the book of life. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 3 through 4, it makes it clear. It says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fell, help those women which were labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow labors, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. I can rejoice in the Lord. I have the joy of the Lord. I can always be thankful. Why? Because my name is written in the book of life. And let me tell you, when he wrote it down, he used permanent ink. It's a done deal for me. Amen. Not everybody in every dispensation, meaning every time period, has eternal security. Actually, I only teach eternal security from a guy from the cross to the rapture. Okay? The other areas, there's things involved, but it's not eternal security. They'll be judged at the great white throne judgment. Okay? You, you realize some people at the great white throne judgment is granted eternal life? Yeah. Old Testament saints. Millennial saints. I mean, you, you have both of those are judged. Sin isn't removed in the millennium. That's why they rebel at the end of it and go to the battle of Gog and Magog. People don't think about that. People don't think about that. There's more to it. And uh, so, But that's getting into dispensations. That's getting into something different. But for you today... You today, the way to avoid the judge, great white throne judgment is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you receive Him as your Savior, your name's written in the book of life. 
your name is written in the book of life. Revelation 21, verse 23 through 27, it talks about New Jerusalem, heaven coming down. That's over here on the new earth and the new heaven. It says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only ones gone there are the ones that has their name written in the book of life. Say, preacher, how do I get my name written in the book of life? You have to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if your name's not in the book of life, the lake of fire will be your destination. Let me tell you, I'd rather face God here at the judgment seat of Christ than face Him here at the great white throne judgment. I'll face them at the great one at, at the judgment seat of Christ. That's where I'll face them. I, I I know I have to take and put my body in subjection. I don't want to be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ. But I'm not worried about the great white throne judgment. Why? Because my name's written in the book of life. How about yours? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you trusted Jesus Christ and received Him, the righteous? He judged the sin of the world. He'll pay for your sins. That was taken care of at the cross of Calvary. But you need to receive them. You need to accept them. Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, do not go out them doors lost today. We can show you how you can be saved. Let's close with the song. Let's close with the song.